Hello everyone and welcome back to One Soccer. I'm your host for today, Josh Deming, and we are back with another episode of Canadians Abroad. There were plenty of storylines happening this past week. We have Alfonso Davies struggling in Champions League, Mo Farsi absolutely crushing it in Major League Soccer. We have a big story as well, a trade that happened between Inter-Miami and CF Montreal involving Kamal Miller, plus a lot more. I have a few special guests on today's episode as well, so hopefully you guys are excited, and if you are, let's get into the episode now. To kick off this week's episode of Canadians Abroad, we will start with Alfonso Davies, who after getting eliminated in the quarterfinals of the DFB Pokal against Freiburg, they faced Freiburg once again midweek, and it was a hard-fought match where they won 1-0 to sit at the top of the Bundesliga table with a 17-7-3 record. Davies started the match playing all 90 minutes as a left back in a 4-1-4-1 system. It was business as usual for Davies as he looked very involved, looking good on and off the ball. I mean, it is what us Canadians have come to expect from Alfonso. He's one of the most consistent players on Bayern, and 9 times out of 10, he puts in a great shift. That one other time though just happened, as midweek Bayern were absolutely outclassed by Manchester City, losing 3-0 in the first leg of the Champions League quarterfinals, and it was not the best showing from Davies. No, not at all, and that is probably the first time that I think we've seen Davies struggle that badly, especially defensively, because over the last year or two especially, he's really come on a lot defensively in his game, just in terms of the awareness, the timing of his challenges, reading certain situations, and Bernardo Silva was just running circles around him time and time again. And you do have to give credit to City as well for how they approach the game, especially because it actually directly affected Davies' flank in terms of City really focusing a lot of their buildup off goal kicks on their left flank, kind of drawing Bayern's press towards them. And then that would create two versus one overloads on Davies' side. And then that left him with a conundrum. Do I mark Silver? Do I mark De Bruyne? And because Bayern players weren't covering those spaces very well, and you saw a perfect example of it for the first goal, it meant that there were so many issues to cover up but in general 1v1 Davies for one of the first times maybe since that Barcelona game at the Camp Nou when he was facing Usman Dembele that was probably the last time he struggled that badly in one-on-one -on -one situations defensively for sure. In my opinion, Davies was playing some of his best football I've ever seen him play under Nagelsmann, thriving in the left wing back role. However, Tuchel has made it very clear that he wants to play in a back four system, meaning that Davies will have to feature as a left back in a back four going forward. Now Bayern as a team were dreadful against City, but I think it is fair to say that changing from the back three to a back four has caused some major problems at the back for Bayern. That's certainly the looks of it right now. And what is fascinating to me is Tuchel really has made his name over the last few years using a back three or a back five, especially with the wing backs being so crucial in certain areas where he likes them to stay kind of high and wide, but then tuck into a back five when they're off the ball. And then that usually leads to a lot of defensive solidity. But the fact that he's gone now to really more of a flat four, especially considering Nagelsmann really loved to, to utilize Davies further up the pitch, that discombobulated a lot of things. And you can see that the Bayern players in general are still kind of coming to grips with those changes because Look at the second goal for Man City, and you see that Benjamin Pavard is directly in the cover shadow of Man City's press, which meant Upamecano can't get a direct outlet to him, and then he has to dribble it forward into City's press. He concedes possession, and then they have a clear counterattack the other way. Bayern players are left scrambling, and it's just a complete disaster. So I, I think that th these tactical changes are affecting the entire team, not just Davies, but the fact that he was so integral to Nagelsmann's system and in general to Bayern's system over the last few years since he's become a starter, to then suddenly go through that drastic of a change, and especially in this you know, big of a game as well, that's probably not going to help things at all. So really, it's just a litany of issues that have contributed to it, from Davies himself not having a great defensive showing to having to come to grips with another tactical tweak and another coach. Nagelsmann was on track to lead Bayern to a treble. They were leading the Bundesliga, looked very strong in Europe, and they were the favorites for the DFB Pokal. But now, only after a few matches in charge for Tuchel, it looks like they will only have the opportunity to win one title this season, and that is the Bundesliga. 
Despite this mediocre start for Tuchel, it seems that he has the backing of the board and apparently he won't get criticized until next season. So right now for the rest of the season for Alfonso Davies, I guess he's going to have to shift his game a little bit to get used to playing in that back four as a left back. He will still have the ability to go forward as Davies always does, but he'll definitely have to be a little bit more aware defensively going forward. The Canadian women's national team are back in action on Tuesday as they took on France in a friendly as part of their World Cup preparation. This was a true heavyweight matchup as France sit fifth in the FIFA Women's World Rankings and Canada are just one place behind them in sixth. Canada have lost three of their last four matches heading into this fixture and unfortunately fell once again losing 2-1 against France, meaning that they have lost now four out of their last five matches. So to take a look at what went wrong for Canada in this match, I brought on Jess Lisi to break it down for you all. You know, I didn't think it was Canada's cleanest performance necessarily. We obviously saw them in the Chivalese Cup. That was a rough uh, couple games for them. But moving into this match, you know, they, they had a lot of adversity swirling, whether that was with injuries or, you know, what they've been dealing with off the field. Um, with that said, I thought they did really well. You know, at, in the first half, it was a bit of a struggle. We saw their, them being broken down defensively very easily. Um, there wasn't really much of an attack, even though they did create two opportunities there, one with Sinclair and one with Heidema. Um, they, you know, it just, it wasn't their half. I did think that they got a little lucky that France wasn't very clinical in their finishing. Um, however, when you move into the second half, Canada really brought that unity. They brought that fight. We saw Haidema obviously able to capitalize on that opportunity. I, I do want to say shout out to Jesse Fleming and Schmidt for, for really holding it together in that midfield. I also want to say Jade Revere made such a big difference, you know, when she, when she did come into the game and she was able to get forward, Canada really hasn't had that they've been missing that so those fullbacks getting forward getting those balls in the box is what caused Jordan to be able to to tap that ball in so although it wasn't the cleanest of games um, I did think that they showed a lot of heart and they showed a lot of fight they were able to fight all the way to that 90th minute and yes they came up short but I do think that there is you know there's some confidence that was built regardless because they were able to bounce back from that two nothing um, that two nothing deficit. So I do think that there's a lot of positives coming out of this game. It's it's a stepping stone for them, no doubt. And, and you know, going into this World Cup, yes, they do still have to find their perfect combinations of players, especially up front. Um, but I am hopeful that that they'll be able to figure it out before then, and you know, get everything together and, and win this World Cup. Mo Farsi was in action this past weekend, starting and playing all 90 minutes as a right wing back in a 3-4-2-1 system. In the match, Farsi had 76 touches, completed 78% of his passes, created two chances, had six recoveries, three clearances, and picked up a fantastic assist as he eased past the opposing defender and put in a perfect cross for Ramirez to coolly finish off. The crew went on to win the match 2-0 against DC United to sit fourth place in the East with a 4-1-2 record. We are only a few weeks into the new MLS season and Mo Farsi is absolutely thriving under Wilfred Nancy right now. He's just getting better and better with each and every week and it's only going to be a matter of time before John Herman takes a look at him and gives him a Canadian men's national team call up. Yeah, it's been a big season so far for Mo Farsi over at the Columbus Crew. He's really just stepped up nicely, signed that first team deal last fall, got a bit of a taste of MLS action, had his first assist and you know now it was almost perfect. It was a match made in heaven really when Wilfred Nancy came in given his history of playing back threes with aggressive wing backs as you just immediately thought of what Farsi could do and I think we've seen that impact. It started slow in game one, uh, you know Columbus as a whole were really finding their feet, Mo Farsi included, but since the Wilfred Nancy system's really taken hold, Farsi is just, he's taken off. I mean he's just given so much freedom to run down that right side to kind of do his thing offensively because the offensive talent's always been there we've seen it at the cpl level we've seen it at the futsal level we've seen it at the canadian under 23 level he loves to take on defenders he loves to just be you know destabilizing and, and, and get to the byline whipping crosses try to take shots if it's on uh, and so it's no coincidence no surprise really that he already has two assists on the year and i mean his his most recent assist was just beautiful the, the way he ran at you know the defenders got out got open played that nice little cut back and then got the assist and that's exciting because that sort of offensive talent is hard to teach and you know Nancy is also doing a good job of helping him grow a lot defensively he's getting a lot more involved winning more duels just being more disciplined and positionally responsible you know and learning a lot the same way like an Alistair Johnson took a huge step forward last year at Montreal so now for Canada it's going to be interesting because obviously in tough with Richie Larea, Johnston, Tejon Buchanan all capable of playing at that right back position um, but if someone like Farsi would absolutely be intriguing if, if Canada does want to keep playing a 3-5-2 with wing backs. Uh, you know, Johnson does play center back. It maybe allows you to push Buchanan higher up the field as a forward. Having Farsi compete with the Richie Larea could be 
you know, a perfect solution potentially to at that position long term, just given the skills he offers. So very excited to see how Farsi continues to develop going forward. Kyle Aaron was in action over the weekend, starting and playing all 90 minutes as a striker in a 4-3-3 system. In the match, Laren had two shots, 33 touches, created two chances, and he picked up an assist. It was a clever assist as well as Laren did great holding off the defender to lay the ball on perfectly for Amala to smash home. Unfortunately though for Laren, things took a late turn. Valladolid were leading 3-2 and Laren was called for a handball, giving away a penalty which was converted, meaning that Valladolid went on to draw the match 3-3 against Mallorca to sit 17th place in the table with an 8-5-14 record. Valladolid will be very disappointed not to pick up all three points as they are still only two points out of the relegation places. This was, however, Paulo Pezzolano's first match in charge. I thought Valladolid looked pretty good and it does look like Kyle Laren will remain the starting striker going forward for Valladolid, which is a great thing for the Canadian. Jonathan David was back in action this past weekend, starting and playing all 90 minutes as a striker in a 4-2-3-1 system. In the match, David had three shots, 43 touches, completed 81% of his passes, he created two chances and had a frustrating match up front. Lille went on to lose the match 1-0 against bottom of the league Angers to sit fifth place in the table with a 15-7-8 record. They are currently holding on to the final European place. That is because one of Toulouse or Nantes will win the Coupe de France, which means that only the top five places in Ligue 1 are European places and Lille are currently holding on to a Europa Conference League place. David has not scored in three matches since scoring a hat-trick against Lyon, although he is still tied with Mbappe at the top of the league on scoring charts with 19 goals. Sitting just one goal behind Jonathan David is Florian Balogun, who has been recently linked to replace Jonathan David at Lille. It is expected that Jonathan David will leave Lille this summer, although there hasn't been much mention of which club or clubs will be interested in David. I find it interesting though that Balogun will potentially replace David that will allow him to go to another club, potentially like Arsenal, which is Balogun's parent club. And there's also been a couple little rumors that both RB Leipzig and AC Milan are also interested in Jonathan David and Florian Balogun. Either way, I think it's fair to say that some big clubs will come looking to sign Jonathan David this summer. Charles Andreas Brim starred this past weekend as he started and played 90 minutes as a right wing in a 3-4-3 system. In the match, Brim had 45 touches, he had two shots, created two chances, he scored a brace, picked up an assist, and was the man of the match in a very impressive performance. The game-winning goal was simply incredible. Brim ran onto a loose ball inside his own half and then sprinted right through the opposing defenders in on goal and had a nice finish with his weaker foot. FC Eindhoven went on to pick up such an important win after defeating the league leaders 4-2 to sit 6th place in the table with a 14-8-10 record. Brim was named into the team of the week and he now has 11 goals and 6 assists in all competitions, improving on his 9 goals and 1 assist return from the last campaign. Brim is still on the books with Sparta Rotterdam and you would have to imagine that he will be playing in the Eredivisie next season, whether that's going to be returning from loan to Sparta Rotterdam or potentially another Eredivisie club looking to sign him, but he is thriving right now and he needs to take that next step and I think that if you can find the right club, he will have success in the Eredivisie next season. Alistair Johnson featured in yet another derby this past weekend, starting and playing all 90 minutes as a right back in a 4-3-3 system. In the match, Johnson had 84 touches, 6 recoveries, 4 interceptions, 5 clearances, he won 12 of 15 duels, and he was fouled 5 times as Celtic went on to defeat Rangers 3-2 in the Old Firm Derby to sit 1st place in the table with a 29-1-1 record. Johnson has been so good for Celtic this season, I mean just look at these stats. So far in just 990 minutes played, Johnson has 13 key passes, he has a passing accuracy of 87%, he has 56 recoveries, 54 duels won, and 20 tackles. His performances also earned him some praise from his manager as Ange had this to say. From the moment I spoke to him, I knew he'd do for me. I finished off the Zoom call and said to somebody, he's going to do well here. He's just a winner. He's determined to get the best out of his football ability. He's embraced the culture here and embraced the responsibility he has. You know, in four months, he's had three of these games, three derbies, and I think he's excelled in all of them. The Old Firm Derby is one of the best derbies in world football, and the fact that Alistair Johnston has played in three of them this season and has won them all is something special. On Wednesday, there was a blockbuster trade that took place in Major League Soccer between CF Montreal and Inter Miami as Inter Miami announced that they have acquired Canadian international center back and MLS all-star Kamal Miller plus 1.3 million in 2023 general allocation money from CF Montreal in exchange for midfielder Bryce Duke and winger Ari Lassiter. Inter Miami will retain a sell-on percentage for both Duke and Lassiter, while Montreal will retain a sell-on percentage for Miller. 
Now this type of trade does make sense even though I didn't really see it coming. I'm really intrigued to see how Kamal Miller will do. It is not his first time in Florida, obviously coming through and playing in Orlando City. So he'll be going back to where he's somewhat familiar. And I think that this trade just in general could be good for both parties. That is all the time we have for in this edition of Canadians Abroad. I really hope you all enjoyed it. And if you did, be sure to tune in for next week's update.